So whenever you take a job of any kind, whether you're hired for something or maybe volunteering for something, there is an expectation of productivity, of you doing your duties and achieving some kind of results. For instance, if I was hired by Fritzkies or someone else to truck at harvest to truck grain, I'd be expected to be there at the combine, get it in the truck and take it to their proper bin and get back in good time. If I was a pasture manager, I'd be expected to care for the cattle and for the land, treat sickness in the cattle, make sure there's good grass, water, fences, and so on. And that goes for kind of any job. You have things to do. Well, Jesus gives his followers roles and responsibilities and has the expectation that we will fulfill them, that we will faithfully carry them out. Jesus' followers in the passage we're looking at today, verses 11 to 17 of Luke 19, they're expecting him to basically immediately rule in his kingdom. And so he tells a parable so that they can help them understand uh, what to really expect. Jesus expects his people to be busy with his business. And when his kingdom is brought in, he will reward accordingly. Now, Jesus just just literally the verse before this, uh, this started in verse 10 of, of Luke 19 stated his purpose as the Messiah, the son of God. Uh, and he said he, that he had come to seek and to save the lost, which what he was actually doing in Jericho with a blind man and then with Zacchaeus, the tax collector. And this leads the crowd of his followers uh, that are with him to have further anticipation of greater things yet and of him bringing his kingdom in his rule and his power and his glory. So is the kingdom right now? Luke 19, 11. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So we're given right at, the out, out, right at the beginning of this whole section, there were the reason, the purpose of this parable right off the bat. We have to understand this story in light of the people's anticipation. Jesus has been doing some pretty incredible miracles. He just finished making a blind man to see, for instance. And he'd been calling himself a title, the Son of Man, which is a title for the Messiah. The king who is sent by God to rescue and rule Israel. And his title comes from the prophecy in Daniel. And now they're coming closer. Only a day's walk to the capital of the nation, Jerusalem, where the king is supposed to reign from. So these guys are in high anticipation. They're eagerly anticipating that Jesus will now use that great power that he's been showing in healing, calming storms, multiplying bread and fish. But now to eliminate the Romans and to rule as king. Therefore, Jesus tells the story of a king who receives his kingdom. Verse 12. He said, therefore, because of the people's anticipation, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. The nobleman, of course, is illustrating Jesus himself and what he will actually be doing as opposed to what the people are expecting that he's going to be doing. A nobleman is someone who is of high birth status, someone who even could be royal. Not necessarily, but definitely could be. Now, Jesus, of course, is the Son of God. He's, he wasn't born, as in he was, he's not the Son of God because he was born and, and was created in some way. But he's eternally one with the Father and equal to him. And he condescended to being born as a human. Jesus is the ultimate of royal status as Son of God. Son of Man, as Messiah, as the Christ, the one who God has set apart and sent to be the Savior and the King. But, according to this parable, the kingdom is going to be a while. He says he's going to go in to do a far country. A far country takes time to get to, as does establishing a kingdom, establishing a government, and then coming back. Now, for the disciples, the people hearing, nothing had happened yet. But for us, we look back in history and we see what happened. We see that Jesus went to a cross. He was killed. He rose again and then ascended to heaven. And now is awaiting the time when his father will send him to rule and reign over the whole earth. And even now, we ourselves, we wait for his return. However, before leaving, the nobleman is giving, is giving some responsibilities to his people. The king gives some roles in verse 13. 
Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, Engage in business until I come. Now the word servant here is the Greek word for slave. They don't often translate it that way, but that's exactly what it means. It's a term that's often used to describe the followers of Jesus. Now we are willing slaves. We are people who willingly give ourselves to serve Jesus as our master. It's a fitting term. No, Amina, just so you know that part too, is a, it's a weight of silver. It's worth approximately three to four months wages. So depending on how you calculate a month's wages, it could be anywhere from $9,000 to $12,000 or maybe even more, but probably somewhere in that neighborhood. So this nobleman, he provides resources to his slaves and instructions of what to do with it. He said, engage in business until I come. Use the resources to make some money. I'm entrusting it to you. I'm investing in you. It's my money. Earn what you can until I come back. It would be like if you worked for a big farmer. Not big as in body, but you know, lots of land and stuff. Uh, and he bought a place and he put you there. And he said, okay. Um, gave you working capital and says, okay, farm this land as best you can for me. Now, Jesus has done the exact same thing for us who follow him, who are his slaves. After his death and resurrection, before ascending back to heaven, he gives all his followers a job to do. And one of those places we see that is Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Engage in my business. Go and make disciples, baptize, teach, observe what I commanded you. And it's everybody who is to do this. The whole church, not just the pastor, not just the leaders. We are all to reach out to those around us and introduce them to Jesus. And we are to do it, as it says in Matthew there, to the end of the age, which is when he comes back as king. But Jesus also gives us, gives us gifts so that we can do the work that he asks. We have received a mina, some kind of resources from God. Jesus said in Matthew there, he said, I am with you always. So he's always with us. Um, so, sorry, he's away, and yet he's with us. But how in the world does he do that? Well, through the Holy Spirit, who is, who, is, who is also God and who is one with Jesus and the Father. The Holy Spirit is given as a gift to all followers of Jesus to actually be in us. We have the very presence of God with us always. We have the Holy Spirit's strength and power with us always. John 14 16 and 17, Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, I will ask the Father, and he will, sorry, he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So along with the Holy Spirit himself, the Holy Spirit himself gifts us, enables us, all of us, God's people, to do God's work in order to serve him. And God gives us with variety so that we can fulfill what God wants us to do. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 and 7 is somewhat familiar to some of us, maybe. He says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For the common good. We're to use it for each other. As slaves of the nobleman, followers of Jesus, we belong to him together as a group, as a body. And we all have different gifts. We have different functions and abilities, big and small. And we're to use these gifts for the good of others. Romans 12 also talks about this in verses 4 to 6. For as in one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. 
And this is, the, for the, this is one of the key things in this parable that Jesus expects his people to use. Let us use them, to use the resources given them to have productive service for him. Jesus expects us to simply be faithful to our tasks. And in that, we will be fruitful, we'll be productive as we wait for him to return. Because for Jesus' followers right then, they didn't realize that the king is rejected. Verse 14 of Luke 19. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, We do not want this man to reign over us. Because as we know, when Jesus goes to Jerusalem, he will be rejected by the leaders of Israel, the rulers, and they will have him killed on the cross. But he will be raised after three days. This rejection of the king was central to God's plan. But Jesus' followers, they didn't understand that part of it. Jesus, the perfect son of God, died so that imperfect, rebellious, sinful people would not have to die for their sins. All the things that we do to hurt each other and in disobedience to God build a sin debt that the justice of God demands payment for. And we deserve to die and not be with God. But Jesus came to pay that debt for us in our place. All he asks of us is that is simply is that if we are sorry for God for doing these things and turn away from them, simply trust that Jesus' death paid for it all, paid for us. And if we do, God will forgive us. He will erase us, he will forgive us our sin, erase our debt, and make us one of his own people. And in doing this, we willingly, of course, give ourselves to God to belong to him and to serve him as our master. And then the Father sends the Holy Spirit to be with us and equip us. Actually, he does it instantly. So that we as his servants, yes, as his slaves, but more than that, as his children, we could serve him. Now, if we finish our course of our lives before Jesus returns, we will go and we'll be with him. And when he comes to establish his kingdom, he will reward us. And those who are alive, when he, when he does come, he will reward as well. But at that time, he will also bring judgment on those who are unfaithful and reject him. The king returns and calls for a reckoning, verses 15 to 19. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know what they had gained by doing business. The first came before him, saying, Lord, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you have been faithful in a very little. You shall have authority over ten cities. And the second came and saying, Lord, your mina has made five minas. And he said to him, And you are to be over five cities. So in the very short space of this parable, Jesus jumps at least 2,000 years from when he left, ascended to heaven, to when he now returns as the king. And at that time, he calls his slaves, he calls his followers to see how they did. And he's simply looking for faithfulness. Did you use what you were given? Did you make gains? And then he rewards based on how well they did. Now, Matthew 25 describes the same time, the same event when Jesus returns. Matthew 25, 31 to 34. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now here Jesus speaks of the reward first, which is inheriting God's kingdom. Then he speaks about their lives, how he's pleased with how they served him. This is kind of the opposite of what he did in Luke 19. Matthew 25, verses 35 to 40. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, why did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick and in prison and visit you? Then the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, 
as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Now there's nothing glamorous about giving food and water, clothing, or visiting someone. But it's an investment of time and of resources that Jesus gives to us, his followers. The mina that was given, the gift and the presence of the Holy Spirit, were used in a way that brought riches for, the king, for God's kingdom. And Jesus is pleased, and he gives the riches of the kingdom to his people. But there was another slave, verses 20 and 21. And then another came saying, Lord, here's your mina, which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you do not, did not deposit, and you reap what you did not sow. This slave is not like the others. Here he calls the king Lord, master, but he did not follow his instructions. It seems like he did nothing while his master was gone. The reason is nothing more than an excuse. He says, I was afraid of you because you're a severe man. Now severe, if you're wondering what that means, it means he's strict in requirement and supervision of others. It means he wants to see action. He wants to see results. He want, which is obviously not unreasonable. To take what you did not deposit and to reap what you did not sow could be said of anyone who has an employees, someone who does the work for you. Sowing and reaping, and you receive the benefit because you own it. It would be like you, it'd be like, um, sorry, it'd be like you as an employee for someone doing nothing all day, and then when you're questioned about it, saying, well, I was afraid because you were expecting me to do something. You expected me to work for you. It's like, well, how would that go over? Well, how did the king respond to his servant? Verses 20 and 23. He said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? The king said that the, the man didn't even do what was minimal. He was asked to use the money, and he did basically nothing at all. Verse 24. And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has ten minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So the king pronounces judgment on the wicked slave and takes away all that he has. Now that shouldn't be surprising, of course. But what surprises the bystanders is he gives it to the one who has the most. Shouldn't everyone be even? Isn't that kind of ideal? Well, apparently not in God's kingdom. The king restates a principle that Jesus has already spoken of in the book of Luke, in chapter 8. In which he con and it was the conclusion of the parable of the sower, if you can think back to that. It was only, it, remember at that point, it was only the good soil that produced fruit. The results that pleased God. The other kind of soil, for various reasons, they basically produced nothing for God. So Jesus concluded that section of the parable of the sower and the soils with, Take care then how you hear. For the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks he has, what he thinks that, that he has will be taken away. And that's Luke 8, 18. The first, of the, the first and second slaves listened well to the master and um, and obeyed him. So they were rewarded with even more, including sharing in the rule in, the, in his kingdom. The last slave here is just like the unproductive soil. The word of the master did not take root. There was no fruit produced. There was no obedience. There was no results of good for the master. Jesus wants his people, his followers, not to be like this unproductive, disobedient slave. He equips us with all we need to live a life that is pleasing to him and to accomplish whatever he sets forth for us in life. John 15, 8, Jesus said this, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Producing fruit is proof that we belong to Jesus. No, fr no fruit means no evidence of a real relationship with Jesus. And if we think about it, everything in our lives 
comes to us as a gift from God. Everything that we are as a person, everything that we have, comes from God's gracious supply to us. And our duty, our basic job for a whole life, is simply to obediently use whatever we have to produce fruit for our whole lives until Jesus comes back. And that's going to look differently for each person, of course, because God gives us all, gifts us all individually. And he's given us different life situations, different families. But like the king of the, in the story, it is simply faithfulness to what we have been giving that God is looking for. It's what he desires from us. And then he will say to us, well done, good servant. But there's one more verse to this parable, and many people find it kind of troubling. Verse 27, but as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Ooh, that's uh, pretty severe. But remember what the picture is here. It is, when, it is a picture of when Jesus returns. And if you think, and, and if you don't know this story, go to Revelation 19, where Jesus comes out of, out of heaven with his armies of heaven, and he wipes out the armies of the earth that are gathered against him. And he then establishes his kingdom and his rule on earth for a thousand years. And at that point, he will gather all the people on the earth like he described in Matthew 25 that I read from earlier, and he will separate the people, like the sheep and the goats. The sheep, his followers, will inherit his kingdom. They will live in that thousand-year kingdom. But to the others, the goats, those who are, as he says here, these enemies of mine, he says in Matthew twenty-five forty-one, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Jesus will pronounce judgment on those who reject him and do not follow him. The time of mercy, the time Jesus gives people to turn from their sins and follow him will be over. And it will and it will be and it will be the time that he and it will be the time that he passes judgment uh, for their rejection of him. An important thing to note when you read the book of Revelation is that this of course is still in the future. Right now, God is giving the whole world, each and every one of us, time and opportunity to turn from our sin and to turn to God. But unfortunately, for those who choose not to, time will eventually run out. Jesus will one day return, and when he does, it will be a day of reckoning, just like in that parable. And those who have chosen, who have not chosen to follow Jesus and to reject him as their king, they will give an accounting of their life to Jesus and based on that rejection of him he will send them into eternal punishment but for those of us who follow Jesus we will also give an accounting of our lives to him but because of our trust in Jesus' death and resurrection to pay for our sin we will not be judged and condemned for our sin we will be rewarded according to how faithful we were to live our lives and use the gifts those minas that were given to us how will we be used to bring, in order to bring results and to bring fruit for God's kingdom? And we're all different people. And like in the parables, God doesn't treat us all the same. But he does give us different gifts and therefore expects different results from all of us. But what is consistent is that Jesus expects all of his followers, all of us, to be faithful, to obey, and do what he asks us in all of our lives. The results are up to him. He brings the fruit. But our job is to use what he gives us for his glory, whatever he asks of us. So how faithful are you? Where is God asking you to change and be more faithful even this week? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this parable that gives us, again, a, you do this a lot, a big picture of what your plan is and even though the disciples really didn't kind of get probably what he was saying there um, in looking at it from our perspective we can see it we can see that you are that king that nobleman and you give us all a job to do and you gift us for doing that job thank you for doing that father help each one of us to be faithful to you in doing whatever it is you call us to do in our lives Help us to serve you in whatever situation you have given us. Just 
Help us to do whatever you have shown us and talked to us about as we heard your word. Help us to be faithful to you. And we thank you that we can do it because you have gifted us. You have strengthened us. You have given us the Holy Spirit. And so we are able to do as you ask. We are able to serve you as our Lord, as our Master, as our King, as our God. And we love you for doing that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.